Welcome to the Cognitive Crucible, produced by the Information Professionals Association. Our website is information-professionals.org, where you can find links and information about today's conversation and get access to members-only content. Join John Bicknell and explore all aspects of our generational challenge, cognitive security. My guest today on the Cognitive Crucible is Dr. Barton Boyd Brown. He is a retired U.S. Army Information Operations Officer and President of Lexington Solutions Group. As a member of the first cohort of Army Information Operations Officers, Dr. Brown has planned and executed I.O. for conventional and special operations forces in Afghanistan, Iraq, the Balkans, and around the globe. His military I.O. assignments include service at the Land Information Warfare Activity as a field support team chief, and later as the J3 Information Operations Division Chief for Joint Special Operations Command. Upon retiring from the Army in 2006, Dr. Brown joined Booz Allen Hamilton, where he supported clients across the Department of Defense and the intelligence community. In 2014, he founded Lexington Solutions Group to provide national security, strategic communication, and management consulting services to both government and commercial clients. Boyd Brown, welcome to the Cognitive Crucible. Thanks, John. I appreciate it. It's good to be here today. I'm hoping that, for starters, you could give our audience a little bit more background about your career. Uh, you're obviously an early information operations officer in the Army, and um, maybe some perspective on how information operations has evolved over the last, say, 30 years. Uh, sure. Thanks a lot. Um, interestingly enough, uh, information operations uh, didn't exist when I first joined the Army in the middle 80s, uh, or if it did exist, it existed in, in the highly classified uh, arenas, uh, sort of what we refer to as behind the green door. Um, I started out my career as an infantry officer. Uh, served in Germany and at Fort Bragg in the 82nd Airborne Division. And after those first few assignments, I uh, had gotten married and we had a couple of small kids. And so I accepted an assignment uh, as an exchange officer at the Air Force Academy as an instructor in the military art and science department. And by that point, it was the, the middle uh, 90s and this whole information operations business was uh, becoming more publicly discussed. Uh, the Army established uh, the Functional Area 30 Information Operations Career Field in uh, in 99, which just happened to coincide with uh, my promotion to major and my uh, time to move on to my next assignment. And I was just completely fascinated with what I had read uh, in the information operations and information warfare space and elected to leave the infantry and move to the information operations career field. And it was, it was a great move and I thoroughly enjoyed it. And uh, it has quite frankly, put me where I am today, making, uh, making that move. Outstanding. So, you know, missing in the biography that I, just read a moment ago. Uh, you're, you're also one of the founding members of the Information Professionals Association. And uh, I would love to get your perspective as well on, you know, the, the founding of IPA, you know, why, uh, you know, we, we are all about creating a whole of society or a whole of government effort to counter the information problem that that we are in the midst of. But uh, I'm hoping that you could tell a little bit more about the, the founding of, of IPA and the importance. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, IPA was, uh, uh, was conceived of uh, over the course of several years uh, by some of us who were members of the Association of Old Crows, um, which, which is an organization that's really focused on electronic warfare. And IO or the information professionals did not truly have a sort of a home organization. And uh, we had 
sort of gotten together in many cases uh, in uh, in Old Crows, but decided that we wanted to form our own uh, organization that was focused more broadly than just the military uh, information problem. And uh, we made a very deliberate deliberate effort from early on to include members of academia uh, and uh, folks from the commercial uh, space uh, as well. Um, we're, we're still we're still uh, making advances in that arena. Uh, uh, IPA at the moment is is a bit more uh, military heavy, frankly, than we'd like. And uh, we are always looking for folks who don't necessarily have a military background, or if they do, they've moved on to the commercial space and they operate in marketing, advertising. Uh, mil, uh, film and media um, and other portions of uh, of industry uh, that very definitely have cognitive security uh, information challenges that they're tangling with, uh, but they're not military because we, we always benefit from adding more perspectives uh, to the problem. Yeah, thanks for that. And of course, uh, the audience can go to information-professionals.org and find out more information about IPA, how to join, and et cetera. So the topic of today is deception technology. And deception has a long history, a uh, long military history, which uh, precedes uh, today's information problems, but, uh, you know, uh, there, there are all kinds of ways that militaries have historically uh, used clever ways to deceive the enemy into, uh, you know, thinking one thing when, in fact, something else is true. Uh, could, you, could, could you give a little tour of historical military deception with some examples that that might help cue up the follow-on discussion about deception technology today sure absolutely yeah i mean anybody who's who's spent any time studying military history understands that deception is is as old as uh armed conflict um you know mm -hmm. from from something as simple as you know, throwing a rock through the through the trees to distract somebody uh, in uh, in you know caveman combat. Um, throughout history, there are examples of deception employed to create advantage where one doesn't exist, uh, to create a picture that uh, that a uh, a force is larger than it actually is or smaller. Or, uh, or that it's moving when it's stationary, or stationary when it's moving, uh, or that you you have either uh, amplified capabilities or reduced capabilities, uh, and, and literally being able to alter your adversary's understanding of reality is what deception's about. Um, and of course, as 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 warfare and technology have advanced together. Um, there have been a whole bunch of different technologies uh, that have been either specifically developed or adapted uh, for the purpose of deceiving an adversary. Um, camouflage netting is one that uh, uh, comes to mind immediately. Um, a lot of these uh, became uh, highly popularized uh, in World War II, and there are numerous books and movies uh, on on deception that uh, um, or, or that that make reference to deception, uh, and uh, the the technology always seems to be a component. Um, so, uh, inflatable tanks, trucks, aircraft uh, that uh, that I think many people have seen photos of from the World War II era. Um, things like uh, freezing a parachute harness in an ice block uh, so that you can drop a parachute behind enemy lines, uh, the ice block melts, and then it appears that there have been uh, paratroopers that have uh, uh, landed in an adversary's uh, area. I love, I, I love that one. That's so, yeah. so, so clever. 
Well, and it, it's it's uh, it, it it's simple. And that's one of the keys to any deception activity is the, the more complicated it gets, uh, the easier the easier it is for a deception to be um, discovered. Um, and uh, uh, but I mean, other examples and and and, uh, and uh, executed, I, I would assume. Right. Yeah, of course. Of yeah. course, the more complicated it is, the harder it is to execute, the harder it is to make it believable. Mm -hmm. uh, for a period of time, um, because uh, that's that's one of the challenges is if an adversary discovers that in fact you're deceiving him, then you know your entire plan can can fall apart as a result of that. But right, but not just uh, not just technologies, but also um, you know military maneuvers such as. Uh, feints and demonstrations, which are actions that are intended to uh, attract an adversary's attention with actual forces that are moving as though they are doing something. Uh, so this this is uh, the use of real people, real vehicles uh, behaving in a fashion that causes an adversary to think that you're doing one thing when in fact you're planning to do something else. A uh, great example of this during Desert Storm was the uh, uh, the left hook that uh, I think uh, is was really kind of the trademark maneuver of the in, of the entire event. And as uh, uh, I was in First Armored Division uh, during Desert Storm, and we were staging mm -hmm. out in the desert um, in Saudi Arabia uh, when the Marines were simultaneously conducting beach landings. Uh, in the North Arabian Gulf um, in positions that they knew they were being observed by uh, Iraqi intelligence elements. Uh, and there were extensive TV broadcasts where the, the embedded reporters uh, with the Marines were uh, reporting on these beach landing rehearsals that they were working on. And it became uh, very believable that the Marines were going to do a beach landing into Kuwait. And as a result, the Iraqis concentrated the vast majority of their defenses along uh, the beachfront and the uh, border uh, immediately between uh, Kuwait and Saudi Arabia that was directly adjacent to the coastline because to all appearances, our main effort was coming through uh, 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 or coming as a result of a, a marine beach landing. And in fact, uh, the main effort uh, came out of the Western Desert uh, under cover of night uh, through the use of global positioning systems, which had, which had just become available uh, in mass. Uh, previously, it, it would have been practically impossible to navigate with that level of precision across uh, hundred, hundreds of miles of, uh, of un basically uncharted desert. Um, and in fact, uh, we were able to uh, completely surprise the Iraqis, and I think everybody saw the result um, as right. uh, uh, you know through through closing Desert Storm uh, main combat operations in a hundred hours, basically. So, yeah, yeah, a uh, you know uh, spectacular uh, example of you know using information and deception to you know taint the information the, the enemy's information environment and confuse decision making on the part of the enemy yeah absolutely yeah all right so there's a you know recap of uh, you know historical military deception so let's uh, you know start taking this into the present day deception technologies that are being uh, developed and deployed in support of, you know, uh, military operations or even, you know, in the commercial space. Absolutely. So uh, the, the work that I've been doing recently with, uh, um, with my company, uh, we've, uh, we've struck up a partnership with a cybersecurity company and their trademark product is a deception technology product that uh, uh, takes these cons these historical concepts of deception uh, that we've talked about already and translates those into cyberspace. 
because just like uh, the military maneuvers in the physical world, uh, there is maneuver going on in the cyberspace. There, there is attack, there is defense, uh, there are layers of security. Uh, there are people um, conducting uh, reconnaissance and collecting intelligence and gathering uh, other information and using that environment for communication um, and, uh, and for financial transactions uh, and storing data there. So there, there, are, there, there are a tremendous number of parallels between the physical world and the cyber world. And so just like deception uh, activities and deception technology in the physical world um, can enhance uh, operations in the physical world, deception technology in cyberspace can do the same. Um, and what we've been working on specifically is capabilities that allow um, a user to create the appearance that their network environment is configured differently than it actually is. Um, the, the the old model for uh, cybersecurity used to be that we were going to establish a firewall. We would create mm -hmm. an imp impenetra impenetrable cyber barrier that no adversary could ever get through. And we right. very quickly discovered that that was a ridiculous idea. And over the last uh, several years, the idea has uh, changed significantly in the, the Every network administrator assumes that his network is going to be penetrated, and in many cases assumes that his network is already penetrated, right. uh, such that we have uh, what is referred to as a zero trust model inside of cyber networks. The idea that there are multiple authentications required, um, even for insiders within an environment before they can access certain information uh, hmm. or before they can uh, use particular devices that are on uh, on the network uh, requires multiple layers of authentication uh, because the assumption that the attacker is already inside your network. Right. Um, the, the interesting thing though is that Deception technology that allows you to create a false picture of what your network looks like allows the network defender, the network administrator, to effectively weaponize his security program. Because network security has heretofore been reactive and uh, defensive only in nature. The application of deception technology that creates a false picture of your network allows you to send your intruder down a hall of mirrors such hmm. that he spends time, effort, and energy and resources on attempting to compromise devices that don't actually exist. Uh, the technologies we're working with right now uh, are entirely software-based such that they emulate the legitimate devices on the network and if you have for example 25 workstations and three printers and a server and you know various uh, internet of things devices connect to your network um, with deception technology you can magnify the size and complexity of your network such that instead of having 25 workstations on your uh, network it appears that you've got 125 and you've got numerous printers and multiple servers and uh, dozens and dozens of uh, IoT devices connected that, uh, that in fact don't even exist. But to a network intruder who only understands what he sees from his limited perspective as a network intruder, Mm -hmm. He's trying to compromise devices that are on your network because they are in all aspects exactly uh, replicated uh, of the legitimate devices. Hmm. Um, so you, you, uh, f fascinating description. I love, I love the hall of mirrors analogy that, uh, I mean, that, 
that that really works uh, as far as uh, you know painting the picture of you know going into a foreign uh, cyber uh, environment and finding yourself just completely perplexed or bewildered or uh, going down dead ends. But you, you said that this that this is also like you know uh, weaponizing defense, and it's. It's not so. It, it sounds like it's not so much weaponizing defense in that the adversary is being attacked, but rather it turns into a, uh, a resource suck for, for for the adversary. And if you're if you're stealing time or you're you're making the adversary's uh, time spent, you know, fumbling around your network you know, uh, useless, then that is in fact weaponization. Right. Absolutely. I mean, what, one of the, you know, to not, not to go too far down a military doctrinal rabbit hole, but oh, no, 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 know, let's do it. But no, but what, <laughs> no, but one, one of the, one of the classic purposes, um, you know, of an attack is to disrupt an adversary's activities, whether whether that's an adversary's attack or an advers adversary's defensive positions or whatever, it's it's to disrupt his ongoing activity. And the use of deception technology as a cybersecurity mechanism does exactly that. It disrupts your network intruders' activity trying to conduct reconnaissance on the network. Um, mm -hmm. the, the other advantage that that these technologies, uh, if they're configured properly, um, and you know if you if you select the right uh, deception tech partner um, is is that it it helps you answer one of the age old problems of uh, of conducting deception operations and that that problem is the question of whether or not your deception is actually working have you fooled your adversary um, you know because if you are the target of a deception. And you discover it, you know. A technique is to go on acting as though you believe what's happening, such that you can then defeat the deceiver's uh, plan. But uh, deception technology, properly employed, uh, creates an alert system such that when an adversary uh, in a in the cyber environment contacts one of these software emulated devices on a network, it sets off a high fidelity alert back to the network operations center such that they understand that there's an intruder, here's what they're looking for, and here's the device that they've gone after. And it happens in real time and it allows the uh, network administration uh, team to make a decision on how they want to handle that intrusion. Do they want to close ports in order to lock out the uh, intruder? Uh, or do they want to let them continue down the hall of mirrors such that they understand, they gain a greater understanding of what their tactics, techniques, and procedures are, what their objectives are. Uh, are they trying to steal intellectual capital? Uh, is this, uh, an organization, or is this is this seeking financial gain? Uh, are they trying to use uh, your organization, your network, as a jumping off point to get to one of your business partners? Um, so you may not be a target truly at all, other than as jumping off point. And and well configured deception tech will let you gain a greater understanding of what your adversary is doing. Um, while simultaneously continuing to protect your network. Well, yeah, okay, so that's all fascinating stuff. And I can imagine that there must be a growing demand for these kinds of services, not only within the, you know, within military operations, but also in the uh, private sector. Oh, absolutely. Um, the, uh, uh, the use of deception tech is is pretty widespread um, across uh, a number of uh, commercial sectors. You know, frankly, uh, the the commercial uh, business tends to tends to lead uh, the military in a lot of cases with regard to uh, 
cyber technology. Um, not in all cases, but uh, but in many of those, and deception tech is uh, is uh, is this is it's also the case with deception technology. You know, one of the one of the large challenge, one of the significant challenges with with deception tech, and with um, uh, getting with implementing it and selecting a deception technology is having an understanding of uh, some of the some of the challenges with deception tech itself. Um, one is scale. Um, how how large do you want your network to uh, appear, um, and how hard is it to to scale up deception your deception tech uh, solution? So as you're as you're choosing which deception tech partner to go with, uh, that's certainly a consideration. Um, and the other is what degree of interaction and complexity uh, you want these various targets uh, on your network to be loaded up with. Because if you uh, install these software emulated traps, lures, and decoys on your network, some of them um, will be emulating devices that typically don't uh, don't store data uh, they don't uh, they don't act as a communications hub maybe there's something like a printer uh, maybe there's something like an IOT device um, that uh, um, you know may not may not be a, a target but in some cases you may look for a full uh, operate fully operating uh, you know a full OS trap uh, it has a running operating mm -hmm. system. It has data. Uh, it has communications records, and so forth. And so, the level of complexity uh, and the level of interaction that you expect your intruder to take with regard to certain devices on your network uh, is, is another consideration. Um, because those two things—the question of scale and the question of uh, of interaction. Uh, have significant manpower implications for the network defender. If a network, if a uh, deception tech is uh, deployable uh, at scale very easily, well, that saves time, it saves energy, and therefore it saves money. Uh, if um, you have the ability to have some highly interactive emulated devices and some not very interactive uh, devices on the network that allows you to um, to throttle your engagement with any intruder, uh, such that you you have greater control of the engagement. And again, you you can choose how to uh, shape that intruder's view of reality as they try to move around your network laterally or and conduct their reconnaissance as they're uh, moving on to whatever their ultimate target is. Hmm. Yeah, it's a fascinating stuff. That uh, the uh, you know security in general, the, uh, you know, uh, uh, home home security, uh, business security uh, is you know a you know cost of of, of doing business, or it, uh, it winds up being you know just like a sunk cost. I guess where uh, it's like you know, uh, cr criminals or you know cyber cyber actors, I suppose, are going to be encountering these kinds of environments increasingly, and they'll probably start turning into, you know, more like a uh, you know, locked door. If, if a burglar, you know, comes up to a home and the door is unlocked, well, it's like, okay, easy pickings, I'll go on in. But if they encounter an actual locked door, then it's like, ah, shucks, this is too too much trouble for me to continue. So if a, a, a cyber actor stumble, you know, will probably increasingly be able to, you know, recognize when they've, you know, hacked into these kinds of environments and then they will quickly just say, ah, this isn't going to be worth my time. I'm out of here. But, you know, I mean, that's, I mean, in, in a way that's success, but it, it's also a, a continuing of the uh, arms race for, uh, you know, being able to, you know, do, do damage in the um, cyber world. Right. Well, and that uh, uh, despite technologies warfare over the, uh, over the thousands of years uh, has some basic principles 
uh, that continue uh, regardless. And I mean, the, the competition between, you know, the, the armor and the item to pierce the armor is, is what we're looking at in the, in the cyber arena. Um, mm. so it's, it's the same, uh, it's the same problem just in a different, uh, just in a different venue. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. Fascinating stuff. That's, uh, uh, very, very interesting. Well, so to, to wrap up, I always like to ask our guests if, uh, they can, they can suggest a couple of, uh, books or resources that, um, you know, our audience may not already know about that has, you know, something, something relevant to the information environment, cognitive security. What, what are some of your favorites? Um, yeah, so I, I've got two for this. Uh, the, the first is uh, is Persuasion and Power. Uh, the author is James Farwell, um, and it's it's really a, a relatively uh, recent history of influence operations, and influence activities, very heavily focused on the Department of Defense. Um, but it also spends a good bit of time talking about the role of the Department of State. Uh, and national leadership um, with public diplomacy and, and strategic communication and how, you know, in concert with DOD, uh, these, these other elements of the government uh, come together to, uh, to try to put forth a, a consistent message uh, to, uh, to adversaries, to uh, uh, friends and allies, because, you know, strategic communication and, and uh, communication efforts in general are not, not just adversary focused. Uh, you may, you may deceive adversaries, you may deter adversaries, but you need to reassure allies and you need to make sure that they understand what our intentions are. And then you follow those intentions up with actions that, that demonstrate that we're telling them the truth. And uh, all of that uh, comes together um, in, uh, persuasion and power. So I think it's, a, I think it's a good uh, recent history of influence activities. Um, and, and then the other is a bit more, a bit more technical. It's a bit of a how to, um, and, and this, uh, this one's called the elements of influence. Uh, it's by Alan Kelly. Um, and it is, it is really uh, about how to, conduct influence activities. And he refers to these as plays. Uh, one of the quotes from the book is, you run plays and plays are run on you. And, and he breaks down uh, a number of different techniques and tactics for uh, deceiving, confusing uh, adversaries in order to uh, you know, influence their behavior. And it's a, it's, it's a fascinating book. And it's uh, like I said, it's it's a it's a very um, it's a very technical uh, how to sort of uh, uh, approach to to uh, exertion of influence. All right, oh, outstanding! Those uh, we will have links to those in the show notes. And with that, Boyd Brown, thank you so much for being on the Cognitive Crucible. Well, thanks, John. It was, uh, it was a lot of fun. The Cognitive Crucible is the only podcast dedicated to increasing interdisciplinary collaboration between information operations practitioners, scholars, and policymakers. To find out more about the Information Professionals Association, visit us at information-professionals.org. Please support our podcast by giving us a five-star rating and leaving a review.